if you want to put the um, uh, the handbook up, that would be great to show it in the uh, in, in the room in the uh, visual. Okay, we are live. Hey, everybody! This is Harvey Sluggo Wasserman. Welcome you all to the hundred and seventh Green Grassroots Emergency Election Protection Coalition Zoom call. Uh, great to see so many uh, familiar and brilliant faces with us. We have a very, very packed agenda. As always, I want to welcome uh, Margot King and jo John Steiner, my reason, Tatanka Bricker, some of our real mainstays, and Hetty Tripp is with us from St. Cloud, Minnesota. Uh, Hetty wearing my Silver Topia t shirt. Thank you, Hetty. Uh, <laughs> and you have secured the presence of Keith Ellison for next week, which will be Greek, the Greek Call 108, where we are going to have a grassroots Congress with a major focus on people doing grassroots organizing. Our agenda today is packed as always. We're gonna introduce you to the beginnings of our, um, uh, our Green Grassroots um, Emergency Election Protection uh, Guide to Grassroots Organizing. Um, what comes out of the Georgia Miracle and a lot of other stuff. We're, gonna, we've put the, we're putting the link in the chat so that people can see it's up at the website the grassroots ep.org or the uh, election protection 2024.org. This is where we are. This is the People's Guide to Grassroots 2022 Organizing. And there is a ton of stuff on here. Uh, derived a lot of it from the fantastic work of uh, Ray McClendon the, at the Georgia NAACP and uh, the great um, um, uh, Mil Andrea Miller, uh, who um, has suffered a, a health setback this week, but seems to be back uh, with us. So, um, Gore, uh, Andrea, we're thrilled to have you back with us. This is the major document for grassroots organizing. Uh, we are going to refine it and pass it around, but this is based on the fantastic victory in 2020-21 in Georgia and, mm -hmm. uh, and, and really lays out the basics for every grassroots organizing group uh, in the United States to come forward and win elections that are not likely to be won. So um, this is the really critical stuff. We have uh, Wendy Wiederman on with us. Wendy has been compiling a list of grassroots groups around the country. We're going to be spreading the link to these documents everywhere we can and compiling the uh, networking list for all the grassroots groups that we can uh, uh, possibly find. So Wendy, uh, 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 we'll put her uh, contacts in the chat, please, Wendy, and you will, Wendy, be conducting a um, uh, a, a, a three uh, introduction of three groups uh, as we go along further. Uh, I'm glad to see uh, Danette there with uh, Bernie Sanders. Uh, nice to have you, uh, Bernie, and uh, we will be speaking Yiddish uh, later in the call uh, uh, just for you. Uh, Greg Powis has uh, sent us a note saying he doesn't hear anything. So maybe um, um, uh, Greg, if you, uh, Mike or Steve, if you, there he is, uh, wearing his yarmulke as always. Uh, um, Greg, can you hear us? As I, I always love it when people ask if you can hear. Um, um, Greg, are you are you um, with us uh, in, in audio land? Okay, he's having a tech technical difficulty here, Mike and Steve, if we can correct that. The rest of the um, agenda, we're gonna go, Greg is gonna give us a long introduction to his new film. Uh, we are also gonna talk about uh, the fascist attack in Florida by the governor of, uh, on uh, the right to vote. Uh, they have arrested, apparently arrested, 20 people in Florida who have dared to vote. And I mean, this is a flat out, outright armed assault on the right to vote by Governor DeSantis. We're gonna talk about that. We're gonna talk about the great grassroots victory in Kansas uh, based on uh, restoring women's rights, protecting women's rights in the state of Kansas. Well, a very important uh, grassroots victory that Wendy Wiederman is gonna introduce us to. She's also gonna talk to us uh, with a group called Power of the Polls and a couple other grassroots groups. Uh, Wendy, I see you there. You'll be ready to rock and roll when the time comes. Um, also, we're gonna talk a little more about Ohio, uh, the unbelievable 
attack on the uh, on the maps in Ohio, the gerrymandering that the Republicans absolutely refuse to uh, give up on, even though they've been turned down by the Ohio Supreme Court four or five times already. Truly outrageous what's going on there in Ohio. Um, uh, and then uh, we'll get into our discussion of when, where, and how Donald Trump uh, might be uh, indicted. That's our Tangerine Dream. Um, if anybody can tell me what film Tangerine Dream, the group, made the theme for, I'll give you a free copy uh, of The People's Spiral of US History. And then we're gonna get into Diablo Canyon and the insane situation in California. Hey, Paul. Well, Paul Newman here knows it firsthand. Paul is a homeowner with a solar system on his rooftop uh, that Gavin Newsom now wants to tax, if you can believe it. I mean, it's just outrageous. Uh, here we have a so-called liberal progressive governor in the great state of California who is pushing so oh, nuclear and at the same time trying to kill solar. It's really unbelievable. So um, uh, there you go. Yes, Myla put up an unhappy, unsmiley face. Um, uh, Greg, are we still uh, struggling with your sound? I guess we're still struggling with Greg's sound. I don't know what, what we can do here. So let's, while we're doing that, I want to talk a little bit more about call. this uh, amazing um, uh, handbook we put together. Uh, Steve, if you'll put it back up real quick uh, while we try and get Greg's sound working. Uh, I want everybody to understand that this is a collective um, um, uh, present presentation. That, that was from Ohio. This is a People's Guide to Grassroots 2020 Organizing. Everybody, if you can, go to the web, to our website um, and look under EP Green Action. And it's, this is the, the um, root document of where we are trying to go to make it available for uh, grassroots groups to easily and effectively, nonpartisanly. This is the, this here, this blue thing is the, what is it, 35 minutes of, uh, uh, of a video that we had with uh, Andrea Ray, Tatanka Joel, Robert Wilson uh, two weeks ago, discussing how to do the grassroots organizing that's needed to be done. And then there are a number of other documents um, uh, which are appended. So we are going to uh, add, keep adding. This. Organized. Th this will be a collective uh, presentation, and we want everybody to pass it on, send around the link, and make sure that this is available to every grassroots group in the country. Okay? All right. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Greg, uh, can we hear you now? Still, still having trouble with Greg? Wait, I heard some. I thought I heard it. No? All right, we have 70 people uh, on the call. Um, uh, as soon as Greg gets straightened away there, we'll go to him. I do want to talk real quickly now about what's happening in Florida. The uh, governor of Florida, Ron DeSantis, um, uh, has outright flat out arrested or had arrested 20 people who voted that he claims were not eligible to vote. Wendy, can you uh, tell us a little bit about this from Fort Lauderdale? Wendy Lederman? Go ahead. Yes, thank you. So I'm muting. Hi, thank you everyone. Um, so yes, yeah, so um, what basically started, there was an amendment on the, our ballot um, just a couple of years ago and I actually worked on this as a petitioner to grant um, voting rights back to um, felons who had completed their sentences. And at the time, I mean, we were one of like four states, the states back from Jim Crow and from slavery, really, when, when Black men were just able to get their voting rights back. And so um, this passed like really um, bipartisanly. Like I said, I was on the ground collecting signatures for this. Everybody wanted this. Um, it would have um, reinstated 1.4 million um, votes back to people um, once they completed their um, their prison time and I guess probation. And so when this passed, the legislature on DeSantis and the conservative legislature um, said that they, they made a new law saying, well, you have to pay back all of your fees and fines. But this is such a nebulous term because there's no database that will tell you how much your fines are when you're complete with this. So, um, so flash forward, 
people, um, the state was like reaching out to people, hey, you can register again. And people had to go through um, the, um, the elections office, which was then sent to, their applications were then sent to the, um, the um, secretary of state. And they would receive a package in the mail with the whole process of how to re-register again. And it was a whole state approved, almost state initiated thing where they were like, okay, cool, you can vote again. So go ahead and register. And then they were allowed to register. They were allowed to vote. So all this was sanctioned by the state. And um, last July, July of 2021, apparently um, the Florida Department of Law Enforcement um, got a list of like 20 people that were supposedly uneligible to vote when they did because they were they were told they were allowed to by the state they had to go through that process and so they sat on this for a year until the primary so again this is July 2021 that they get this um th this notice of these 20 people that are supposedly uneligible and now we're in our primaries our primaries are tomorrow the 23rd and 20 people are arrested from their homes in handcuffs for voting in 2020 from the same list that the, the um, law enforcement received a year ago. So, I mean, it's clearly like this, this scare tactic. I mean, can you imagine you, you were in prison and you served your time and now you're, you're trying to exercise your right, you're, you're you know, reconditioned or whatever they wanna call it. And, and now you're, you're trying to be a functional member of civil society and you're arrested again you're arrested again and you go to jail again and we have a cash bail system. So, you know, you're basically um, guilty and proven until proven innocent and you're arrested again for, for just trying to do what the state approved you to do. And again, there's no way for you to know what your court fees are and any like given fines that, um, that they tell you. So, I mean, it's really, I mean, a catastrophe um, and it's just so fascist the way that, um, that this is going on because I mean, it's just scaring the crap out of not just the 1.4 million people that had their rights reinstated, but anybody. I mean, who, like this could go to anyone and this could go to other states. Just the, the ripple effect of this is just unimaginable. Um, and then right. not to mention the on the state attorney that was just fired in, um, in Tampa, who's now suing the governor because he's a state appointed, he was an elected official and the governor just took it upon himself not to have him recalled by the citizens, but to fire himself because he didn't like his personal views. Like, DeSantis right. is dangerous. It's very well, dangerous. and we're going to go to the state just north of you. Thank you for that, Wendy. Thank you. Uh, the state just north of you, Georgia, uh, where Greg Powest has been reporting on behavior very, very similar uh, and has a new film. Uh, Greg, it's great to have you on. Can we hear you? Can you? Yes, I can yes. hear you. Can you hear me? Absolutely. Mazel tov. Okay. Great okay. to have you with us. <laughs> All okay, right. man. So uh, this is the great Greg Powest, one of the premier uh, uh, investigative reporters uh, of our era. It Thank was you. Greg who really started the whole election protection movement back in 2000 uh, uh, when he reported on the um, uh, flooding of the, or, or rather the draining of the voter rolls in Florida by Governor Jeb Bush, uh, who happened to be the brother of the uh, campaign, guy running for president, uh, W. And uh, while everybody's screaming at Ralph Nader for the last 20 years, Greg uh, uh, clearly pointed out, small detail, that the governor of Florida had uh, pulled a 90 or so thousand people of color off the voter rolls in an election decided by 537 votes. So, you know, this is uh, really an amazing thing. And Greg's uh, report, reportage has really guided us uh, over the last 22 years um, with numerous books, uh, stuff on the New York Times bestseller list. And now uh, this amazing new film uh, that's out of Georgia that where they're mimicking what's going on in Florida and in other right wing controlled states around the country. Greg also in, the, in his previous film uh, visited the home of Martin Luther King's grandmother. Is that right? And, uh, <laughs> cousin. Cousin uh, who herself was kicked off the voter roll. So I think the Republican strategy is clear. If you can't win elections, then arrest the people who are going to vote against you. So, uh, uh, Greg, uh, let's let's we're going to see. I think it's a short clip. Yep, I got a two-minute uh, trailer of this film, which I think is a good place to start the discussion. Thank you. Absolutely. So, okay. Steve Caruso, have you got uh, you got Greg's uh, uh, clip here? Uh, let's rock and roll.
So you didn't call him, but you challenged his right to vote or have his ballot challenged. Sir, get out of my house. Okay, I will get, get out, out of, of your house. house. I just now. Voter fraud. Law enforcement is going to their houses and places of employment and making people afraid to go out and exercise their rights. And today to come out and not be able to vote, it bothers me to my core. My life was on the line, you know, I could go to prison. If I just commit suicide, this would be over. Stop voter fraud. They raided a voter registration office and tried to send all of these college kids to jail. Call our voter fraud hotline. Should I get on a campus signed that controversial election bill? He signed Senate Bill 202 last... That doesn't mean that you get to levy a charge against thousands of people that you don't even know and get them, you know, removed off the rolls. Is this an attempt to remove to a lot it. of that Democrats, black people it. No, it from isn't. voting? Get out of my house now. Are you removing black voters from the voter rolls just so you can win this election? Okay. Okay. So let's hear it, Greg. Uh, uh, fantastic. Thank Looks you. killer. When is the film available? When is it out? And tell us about it. Well, uh, we're we're trying to firm up that it will be launched. Of course. If uh, by the way, you can hear me. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, launched in. Uh, we believe that we'll have the opening in Atlanta, October four, and we'll also have an opening in uh, Los Angeles and in New York, um, and. Um, San Francisco, that is uh, Oakland, and then we'll have some uh, Midwest labor unions are putting out the film. We're not doing the big 25 city tour, but Atlanta, Chicago, excuse me, Atlanta, yeah, Chicago, New York, uh, San Francisco, LA. So and, how long is this film and, and what's it about? Okay, Tell so the film, the, the film is a little over an hour. Uh, a television version will be one hour. Uh, Martin Sheen's the executive producer and Maria Florio is the Academy Award winner is producing and uh, the key thing is what we're uncovering here two things number one a whole new system which is brand new but old which is a series of vigilante voter challenges this is brand new it's got no national coverage in the in the law signed by brian kemp last year sb202 there's a lot of discussion about it 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 made the you know, absentee balloting almost impossible. Um, it uh, eliminated, virtually eliminated Dropbox voting. And uh, infamously, one story I did went viral about how it's actually a felony crime to hand someone a slice of pizza or a bottle of water while they're waiting in line for five hours in the Georgia sun. But one thing that has not been noticed is that um, there's a little uh, provision that says that anyone, any Georgia voter, can challenge any other Georgia voter. And the challenges are unlimited. That's brand new. The challenges are unlimited. Now, what do I mean by unlimited? That woman that you saw in the red dress personally, personally has challenged the votes of over 32,000 people. She's a GOP operative close to Trump uh, and um, Brian Kemp and uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene. So she personally challenged 32,000 people. We have another vigilante who challenged 4,000 people. He's the chairman of the Republican Party in Muskogee and also on the state committee. There are 88 vigilantes. They've challenged over a quarter million voters. There hasn't been a word of this in the national press. Now, and, and 
this and when I say unlimited, how they do it, they literally like this woman had 32,000 names that I confronted her. Um, it was so many names, she couldn't even print them out. So she handed in a thumb drive of people to challenge 32,000 people to challenge. And uh, the other guy, 4,000. And I said, and there's their claim is that these people don't live in Georgia. I said, did you speak to any of them? No. Did you call any of them? No. Did you go to any of their houses to see if they're there? No. And you know where they got the list, by the way. So where did all these guys, they got it from True the Vote, which is uh, the, the group out of Texas that did that film, 2000 Mules, about how the election was stolen from Donald Trump, mainly in, uh, in Atlanta. And uh, we, by the way, we have in our film, we have a, uh, a takedown of 2000 Mules. Um, you know, they, they have, they say all these thousands of African-American men, and they're very specific that it's African-American men who are getting $10 each to stuff a ballot into a, a drop box. Uh, so we bust all that. But here's another story that we're telling about that dynasty. And remember, it said the 280 year old dynasty. Brian Kemp has sold himself. Brian Kemp has sold himself as a self-made man from a little town in Georgia as a construction company. In fact, he is a scion of the Habersham family and the um, Russell King family, the dynasties. Both the, and these were the people that first brought enslaved Africans to Georgia. Just so you know, Georgia was one of the only places in America which outlawed slavery. Let me repeat that. Georgia outlawed slavery until just before the Revolutionary War, when Kemp's uh, uh, great great grandfather asked um, the king for a charter to bring in Africans. And, um, and so that's where his money comes from. That's where the wealth of this man comes from. And it's very important to know that Purdue, by the way, was also uh, from that lineage. Um, and today, Kemp is actually a very, very wealthy man. He's, those old properties were sold and created a, um, a new company called Plantation Partners, LLC, believe it or not, they call it. And they own massive, massive tracts of forest, which they sell to the Koch brothers, uh, Georgia Pacific, which is the Koch brothers. So you have this power elite. And it's very important for people to understand this is not about just Georgia, because anything that so True the Vote has organized this mass vigilante challenge of over a quarter million voters. But believe me, it's going to spread all over the nation. And it's backed by the Bradley Foundation, which are the billionaires out of Wisconsin, the right wing billionaires. They're the new Koch brothers, because uh, with David Koch dead, Charles is less political and wants to begin moving away. But so who's the big bucks taking their place? Well, Paul the Vulture Singer, if you've seen my other films, you'll be aware of him. Uh, but also um, uh, the Bradley Foundation, which has put $2 billion into fighting voting rights. $2 billion, including black backing these, these attacks on voter rolls everywhere from Florida to Georgia. And, and I'd add one other thing you'll find in film. So there's this long history and even this history of challenging voters was originally invented by Gene Talmadge, who was the Ku Klux Klan candidate for governor of Georgia. And he won against a, um, a, uh, a sitting governor who opposed keeping blacks from the polling places because uh, Franklin Roosevelt had promised black soldiers that they could come home and vote. Uh, but Talmadge then started this system of the Klan challenging voters. By the way, what Brian Kemp is doing now, this mass challenge of voters through, through the vote. In 1946, the FBI clamped down on this and they were about to arrest Governor Talmadge for these mass challenge of voters. What Kemp is doing now, they're about to indict the governor of Georgia at the time for doing just what Brian Kemp is doing right now. Uh, but he. Um, as I say in the film, he had a he had an unfortunate accident, a collision with a bottle of bourbon, and he died in office just before the FBI was about to indict him. Any questions? Yes. What when they when they challenge a voter? Yes. What happens? Ah, that's very interesting. Um, and by the way, we we didn't you know, if, if the challenges are, are legit, I you know, I, illegal voters shouldn't vote. If you don't live in Georgia, don't vote in Georgia. It's a, it is a felony crime. But we called 800 voters who were shocked to a one that they had been challenged or the idea that they don't live in Georgia, including, by the way, um, 
a lot of the attacks are on uh, African-American voters in the military who've been assigned elsewhere. Like uh, we have a major Kamaliel Turner here in California who, um, who's the military's uh, chief expert on future warfare systems. And he was assigned to California. And so they, uh, they challenged his right to vote saying he didn't live in Georgia. No, <laughs> it's the military. What do you have to do? And this is what's devious. Unlike prior purges, like when I, when I, back in 2000, when I uncovered this mass challenge of, of uh, so-called felon voters who at the time could not vote in Georgia, and we found out about at least 58,000 were convicted of no crime. Their only crime was voting while black. And, um, but they were removed from the voter rolls. So when they went to vote, they found out, oh, you, you can't vote because you've been uh, removed from the voter rolls. You've been purged. But now, under this new vigilante system, it's really devious because you get your ballot and you can mail it in. For example, that soldier should have gotten his ballot and mailed it in, but then they wouldn't count it because the ballot is under challenge. So if you've been challenged, the county is supposed to notify you you've been challenged. <coughs> You're supposed to get this postcard, and then you, then you have to go in personally into that office. There's no other way to do it. You must come in personally to the county offices and go through a hearing, like a court-like hearing to prove you are who you are and you live where you live. And as the major pointed out here in California, because he's, he's here with the military, um, no, he can't just fly to California, uh, to uh, Georgia, to uh, get his ballot certified. Uh, he was lucky in that he found out when they just never sent him his ballot. So he called and said, why, why don't I have my ballot? He says, well, you've been challenged. Um, that was unusual. So at least he found out and he took action. He did, by the way, fly to Georgia and he filed a lawsuit too. Um, so you have this new vigilante Jim Crow trick that we're trying to bust. We're trying to bring in the, the issue of history. And of course, Brian Kemp not only has signed these horrendous SB 202 um, vote suppression tricks. He's also uh, signed a law against teaching of critical race theory, <laughs> but it's about it's a, it's basically banning the teaching of history. Now, why would a guy who's who's hiding the fact that his family brought brought the first enslaved Africans to Georgia? Now, what reason would this guy have to hide the teaching of history? What do you think? Next question. <laughs> well. Um couldn't um wait wait let me get some other people in here to ask some questions any other right. questions who's got a, who's got a hand here um, i just want to say what's to prevent progressives from challenging republicans because we don't do this fucking bullshit like that oh, <laughs> that's okay. the answer and i'm glad that the democrats i'm glad by the way that the democrats have not uh, met the quarter million challenges with a quarter million challenges of their own. I mean, I understand the reason. In fact, you know, I could see someone doing it as a kind of stunt. And but I hope it, uh, I think that the answer to vote suppression is not more suppression, but exposure and ending the game. OK, uh, we have a question from Bernie Sanders here. Uh, Bernie, otherwise yes, known yes. as Jeanette. Go ahead. Huge, I have a huge question. Yes. <laughs> um, thanks for being here, Greg. Um, I'm going to echo a question that Emma who's, who's speaking because I can't see it. Oh, sorry. It's Danette Abbott Wicker. Hello. Oh, she's got a picture of Bernie up there. Oh, Bernie I see. And Maxwell okay. Frost, she's running in Florida 10. If anyone's in Florida 10, vote for Maxwell. He's awesome. Cool. Uh, <laughs> a question I'm echoing what uh, Emily Levy asked in the um, chat. Uh, uh -huh. What are we going to do about all of this before November? What are, what are we doing now to fight all of this? Well, uh, yeah, good question. I'm um, work. Uh, well, I can only tell you what I'm doing and what the groups in Georgia are doing. I'm working. This will be released uh, by Black Voters Matter, Latasha Brown, by uh, the NAACP of Georgia, which is uh, Gerald Griggs, who is the great trial attorney, guy who nailed uh, R. Kelly. Um, he, in, he's my lawyer too, and he's going to be bringing litigation against this system. Uh, in addition, um, we'll also have, uh, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, New Georgia Project, uh, and, and several of the other Georgia groups. The biggest thing is to be prepared for the challenges. Number one, tell everyone, as I always tell everyone, re-register. I know you think you're registered to vote. Well, forget it. Re-register again. 
And even if they say you register, register again, because then you have a record of your contact with, with the county. Now, this is new turf, because literally they could start challenging more people by the thousands on election day. No one knows what will happen. And of course, the, the biggest issue is how do you, where a, voters know that they've been challenged? We didn't find a single voter, the 800 we spoke to, not one knew that they'd been challenged. They're supposed to receive notices, by the way, but they didn't. They haven't. Uh, and if you do, it's like, you know, you get a postcard. It's like junk mail. They know what they're doing. And um, so we have to do what's called ballot curing, which was very successful in 2020. And this is one of the things that that uh, their secret, the Republican secretary of state, who's Brad Raffensperger, who's the most vicious racist secretary of state, well, since Brian Kemp, but also since <laughs> Catherine Harris, since Catherine Harris, um, he's not a hero. He's played as a hero. He isn't. But um, he was saying that the Republicans were shocked that they disqualified. This was the problem for Trump, by the way. Raffensperger had, in fact, and through his, his Republican uh, county operatives, had, in fact, um, challenged tens of thousands of ballots. And what shocked them was that Barbara Arnwine of the Transformative Justice Coalition, Black Voters Matter, New Georgia Project, they ran phone banks. They found the, the names of every challenged voter and got a hold of them and said, we're going to give you a ride to the county offices to fix your ballot. And they literally, if it weren't for that, uh, Biden wouldn't be, he wouldn't have won Georgia, Georgia, that's for sure. So we have to do a huge re-registration, education, and what's called ballot curing campaign to get these people their rights. Wow. We got 93 people on the call. One of them is Dennis Bernstein, the uh, host of Flashpoints on KPFA Pacifica. Dennis, do you want to have a question for Greg? Dennis. There you go. go ahead, Dennis. Uh, so, Greg, I have a question for you. What do you think about the fact that Lindsey Graham managed to dance around uh, the grand jury in Georgia, and why do you think he was so desperate to get out of that testimony? There's two things. By the way, I should notice that Dennis Bernstein, as mentioned, is the host of the fantastic Pacifica program, Flashpoints, broadcast in L.A., uh, San Francisco, and 30 other cities. And every Thursday, I do an election crimes bulletin on Flashpoints with Dennis. Uh, what's happened, Lindsey Graham, uh, uh, let's be careful. The, the headlines are a bit misleading. He's not off the hook. Uh, there's a there are it's going back to the district court to determine which questions he can and can't answer. So he absolutely will be testifying. He's not going to be able to get out of that. It's just a question of whether um, the questions will be restricted. And why is he concerned? Because if because um, just in, in a nutshell, if the the real crime is not trying to tell the secretary of state, oh, find me 11,000 votes, because Brad Raffensperger, the right wing secretary of state there, found hundreds of thousands of people that he removed. Remember, Brian Kemp removed a half a million people from the voter rolls, including 340,146 voters, a third of a million, who were wrongly removed, including Martin Luther King's cousin. I was at the poll when she was thrown out, 92 years old, and she was thrown out saying that you don't live in Georgia anymore. I went to her house down the street <laughs> with pictures of King on the wall. I didn't even know she was King's uh, cousin. Um, and uh, so Lindsey Graham is, 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 has to answer questions about whether he was pushing the idea of an alternative slate of electors, which is a crime when you mail a fake set of electors to the National Archives and with the instructions to have these people voted in Congress that's a go to jail crime. And, and if Lindsay's involved in that at all, he's in trouble because you can go from a witness to a defendant very, very easily. Wow. Amazing. Anything else um, uh, before we move on, Dennis? No, that's good. Good, good. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Speak uh, to you uh, Thursday. Uh, Brian, <laughs> Brian Blakely. Brian. Uh, hello, Greg. Uh, thank you for the magnificent work you do. I very welcome. Just wanted to ask you, um, how much are you in contact uh, with the uh, Warnock and Stacey Abrams campaigns? And I know there are down ballot campaigns as well that are being affected by what's going on. I have deliberately absolutely zero contact with Stacey Abrams or, or Reverend Warnock. Uh, I did uh, the Palace Investigative Fund experts did work. 
uh, last year or the year before with Fair Fight Georgia, which was Stacey Abrams uh, organization, one of her organizations. Uh, but once she ran for uh, declared for um, governor again, uh, we cut off all communications with uh, Abrams and Warnock. Uh, we're okay. we're nonpartisan. I, I just won't participate. Okay, thank you, uh, Brian. Brian, do we have you here? Um, Richard Zindars. Um, is Brian on? Okay, Richard. Hey, hello. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, okay. I'm from Ath I'm from Athens, Georgia, and uh, sorry to say, uh, Brian. So is Kemp. <laughs> Uh, I know. I'm, uh, some, you said he wasn't. You said he's from a small town. and You weren't talking about Athens as a small town, I hope. Well, uh, for, I'm in Los Angeles, so I'm sorry. Yeah. It's a small well, you, goddamn you, you, little town. You, 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 should run, you should run the film here in Athens, you know, because... Well, would you sponsor it? Let's do uh, that. I can tell you who can sponsor it. That'll be easy. But um, uh, two years ago, the head of the Athens political... Uh, uh, Athens, Georgia Republican Party uh, just uh, threw up 4,000 names to the local election committee yep. to get them uh, challenged. And oddly enough, the uh, one of the people they challenged was the wife of a guy I know. And his wife was challenged to be removed from the voter rolls in Athens, Georgia during the pandemic and she's an emergency room physician in one of the Athens hospitals. So, you know, they, they didn't look at anything. They were shocked. And two years later, this emergency room physician who got challenged ends up being the person who takes care of my mother-in-law when she went into the ER for the last time in her life. But um, so what happened was there was a board of election meeting and everybody could go online and see this board of election meeting and the board of elections uh, kicked out en masse all 4,000 ch challenge votes in about yes. uh, 45 minutes. So, so well, that's what you yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So uh, no, no, there aren't safeguards anymore. You just lost those safeguards in, in, in SB 202 there. See what happened is that when there were uh, mass challenges, there are mass challenges in December of 2020, just before the January 5 runoff. And most county elections boards, even those are controlled by Republicans, which are most of them, those um, counties refused to remove these voters, refused to accept the challenges. And uh, in the couple cases that went to federal court, the challenges are thrown out because they were done 90 within 90 days of a federal election. Under the new SB 202, any board which refuses a challenge, this is brand new, any board which refuses a challenge can be replaced by the brand new state elections board, which is headed by, guess who, Brian Kemp. And in fact, uh, right after the law was passed, they immediately fired uh, Helen Butler from the Morgan County Elections Board uh, because she was raising questions about this mass challenges. And she and I both successfully sued Brian Kemp and Brad Raffensperger in federal court, getting them to open their files. So there was a protection and local boards, Republican and Democrats, almost every Republican controlled board threw out these challenges. And that's why in SB 202, they changed the law to allow unlimited challenges and to allow uh, and to require the challenges to go ahead. Uh, and if you don't, you'll be removed by the governor. Unbelievable, unbelievable. Uh, hey, Sluggo, Sluggo, we, we have, have Brian, Do we have Brian or we wanna move on to Richard? Well, we have Ray McClendon from NAACP Georgia. Okay, let's, let's go and Ray jump in if you don't mind everybody who's in line, but uh, Ray McClendon is the state chair, uh, political director of the NAACP. Uh, Ray, earlier on, we flashed on the screen, uh, I believe before you joined us, the, um, the basics of the Voter's Guide, the Grassroots Guide for 2022. Uh, it's up at the uh, website and the uh, and Steve Caruso has posted the, the link. Uh, you, I know you and, and Greg Powers have worked together. So uh, why don't you uh, uh, see what you got for Greg here. And uh, he showed a two minute clip of his film, uh, which I assume you, you've either seen or will see uh, soon enough in Atlanta. Uh, so go ahead, Ray McClendon. 
Well, hey, I, I am just uh, delighted to be on uh, with, with uh, such an esteemed uh, journalist who's doing great work. Thank you. Uh, we, we appreciate all the work that you're doing here in Georgia and, and uh, leading the charge with, with Gerald Briggs, who I'm proud to work with, uh, with the state conference of the NAACP and also uh, with the Atlanta NAACP. So kudos for all that, all that you're Thank doing. You. This, this word needs to get out and uh, we, we need to get people to understand how important it is uh, to stay vigilant during this time. So we're, we're excited about what you're doing and it ties in perfectly with what, what we are trying to get accomplished uh, by informing voters uh, how critical this election is and what the issues are and how they can protect their right to vote. We, we believe that, that uh, their vote is their voice and we want to make sure it's protected. So we, we are up to the challenge along with you and so glad to have you working this diligently in our state. I learned some things from you today about the Kemp family. <laughs> yeah. that we're going to make sure that we keep uh, at the forefront. And it really explains a, a, a lot of things, too, because uh, it, was, it, was, it was very interesting when he signed, when Kemp signed SB202, he signed it underneath a picture of a plantation. I have that in the film. <laughs> yes. I should say, by the way, uh, Gerald Griggs, the president of the NAACP, Georgia, the new president, is a, is a star role in the film. I want to make sure, by the way, that Ray, that I have uh, you should send type in your uh, message, uh, okay. uh, personal message, your email or way to contact you, because uh, I've been dealing basically directly with Gerald because he is my lawyer, personal lawyer, uh, one of my lawyers. And uh, so, but I'd like to, con you know, stay in contact with the staff. That's very, sure, very important. Sure, sure, absolutely. Because and, and I really want to make sure, right, yeah, that we are really every day. So when you can't reach him, you know, reach out. No, I want to reach you me because and we'll, we'll make it work. <laughs> yeah. So what we want to do is we want to make sure that we have a big splash in Atlanta. And um, and you know, last year I also did a report for the ACLU, and um, but I'm much more interested to. Gerald has such a great track record in federal court against these guys that that's one of the ways we want to we want to move. Uh, Absolutely. And Absolutely. but it's very important that we have a big event. I'm I'm trying I'm working right now to get a venue for us, uh, probably at the you know, at the, uh, you know, that that joint action center that Spellman and Emory and and um, Morehouse, I think, uh, control together in Atlanta. Uh, you're right. in Atlanta, I take it, right? Yes, I am. Okay, so we'll we'll you'll hear from uh, uh, Chris Smith, who is working with me. You know, from out of Atlanta, he's with um, uh, March on, and okay. he's going to be coordinating for us. So I'm sorry, it's a little housekeeping in front of everyone in the room. No, but, no, no, but now all I have Ray, you know, so we so we actually connect to make sure that this gets done. But That's yeah, right. I want to send you the information with the the, the okay. trailers and all the rest of the film. And, I want people to, by the way, go to gregpalast.com. Um, and the reason I say uh, gregpalace.com is that, uh, let me get this for everyone, whatever, is that you can get the film or download uh, the trailer, uh, download the information, spread it around. That's very important. So go to Greg Palast. I'm writing this in gregpalast.com. That should go out to everyone. That's where you can get uh, the trailer for the film and the information at the uh, We'll have a All lot right. of good stuff going. Okay, next. Thank you, Ray. Good so, Ray, I'll get a hold of you directly. We have ninety-five, in the chat now. 95 people on the call. Uh, Richard, I believe you're next. Richard, uh, um, uh, I don't see Richard down here. Um, do we have Richard? No, Kevin or Lynn. Lynn would had her hand up a long time. Came back. So, Kevin or Lynn. Well, um, uh, all right. Um, I um, go ahead, Lynn. Do you wanna? No, you want to do Kevin. It? Oh, Kevin, there's Kevin. Go ahead, Kevin, and then Lynn. Uh, just two quick questions. Uh, what, what the Republicans are doing now really is what they did in Florida, and they, they, uh, they took the election because the Democrats didn't have a strategy of fighting back. And secondly, do the people in Georgia, uh, is Stacey Abrams talking about against <laughs> Brown? Because it should, not, it should be in commercials right now. Well, a couple things. Uh, again, I don't deal with Stacey Abrams because I'm nonpartisan. 
Uh, she has a walk on in the film, as does Reverend Warnock, because before they were running for office, uh, I was discussing some of these things with them at the Ebenezer Baptist. And um, but the important thing is not what Stacey Abrams and Democrats are doing. One thing I've been very impressed with Georgia. It is some of the most this has some of the worst Jim Crow tactics of anywhere in America. And this is where they take their stuff for a test drive, whether it's the old cross check system, which we defeated. Um, and many people saw my last film, which you can download for free, by the way, called The Best Democracy Money Can Buy. A lot of that takes place in Georgia with Brian Kemp. Uh, and, um, but the important thing are the voting rights groups, NAACP Georgia, uh, Black Voters Matter Fund, um, the um, uh, uh, Reverend Lowry's uh, organization run by Helen Butler, New Georgia Project. These are, these are the grassroots organizations which make the difference and including the legal teams and the grassroots operators. And, and that's more important than the Democratic Party. The if, you wait, if you're waiting for the Democrats now, to save your vote, forget it. it the it's the grassroots. Have now, hmm? The Supreme Court that we have now, uh, uh, <laughs> the outcome in, that's, in this current Supreme Court is one that I don't even want to consider if it gets that far. Yeah, I wouldn't count on the Supreme Court. Uh, but I would count on, again, the activists. You also have a state constitution and Gerald Griggs and the NAACP are very good at, at using the state courts and understanding how they work. Uh, but beyond litigation is information. Like, for example, back in, in uh, 20, um, uh, 2020, uh, we went into federal court. Gerald Griggs, again, was the chief attorney. We also had C.K. Hoffler, for those who don't know her. She was the president of the National Bar Association, which is the Black Bar Association. We had a lot of uh, Latasha Brown, et cetera. And the judge in the case noted uh, that while we were complaining that 198,000 people were illegally removed, he did note that our campaign had re-registered about 100,000 of those people. In fact, we probably got almost all of the of the uh, uh, active voters. And we did that through a massive public campaign. Um, and, you know, we had uh, uh, videos put out uh, through my, uh, 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 my uh, Leonardo DiCaprio has been very helpful to, to our work, uh, getting it out there. We use a lot of celebrities. Rosario Dawson uh, made billboards. We had billboards over Atlanta telling you to check your registration. So it's a public campaign. This film, Vigilantes, uh, George's vote suppression hitman is part of a public campaign to educate voters throughout the country, of course, but especially in Georgia to check your registration, re-register, contact the registrar's office, be aware if you've been challenged, look out for, for postcards that say your vote isn't being counted unless you come back in. Mm -hmm. So that's the game. We, I don't think we can count too much on the Democratic Party, and we certainly can't count on the uh, Supreme Court to, for justice. Uh, thank you. Uh, Lynn Feinerman, Lynn. Greg Lynn is a radio host and a, a regular on our calls. Lynn, go ahead. Yeah, hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Sorry, I always say that. Um, uh, Greg, love your work. Um, thank you. And um, I would like to suggest that a vote challenge to Raffensperger or Kemp or somebody very visible might be a really, really good thing now based on the fact that they tried to cheat voters out of their proper vote. There you go. Yeah, well, that's that's the idea. That's the point of the film and the other work. We're going to have short stuff. We're going to have radio. We're going to have, and of course, a press conference, I assume, with, with uh, the NAACP, et cetera. Uh, this is, uh, yeah, so it's about letting people know what's going on. At, um, and exposing Kemp, not whether, and I'm not saying you should or shouldn't vote for Brian Kemp, that's up to you. But I think that the voters should pick the governor and the voters should pick the U.S. Senator, uh, not the uh, not Jim Crow trickery. Thank you. Uh, Wendy Lederman with her own stories from Florida. Wendy, go ahead. Hi, thank you so much, Greg. It's such an honor to have you with us. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, just a quick point and a quick question. Um, I really appreciate it. So um, just one thing I was thinking when talking about um, uh, audits and um, like someone who's doing some really great work with uh, just kind of debunking the um, thousand mules thing is Ray Lutz and his audit mm -hmm. engine work and um, either Harvey or myself or anybody could possibly put you in touch with him and his group if you're ever interested because I feel like you guys should be linked. And so um, my question is, um, 
So one thing I forgot about the um the Florida thing is what uh DeSantis did earlier this year, which you, I'm sure you're aware of, he created an office of election crimes and security, which is just like the most 1984 kind of like anti. So it's this like Gestapo enforcement of election crimes where this is the group that went in and investigated and arrested all these people out of their homes for registering to vote like they did. So I'm just wondering, like, do you kind of see this tactic um, being repeated in other places and what would be a way to counter that thank you again okay number one it wasn't invented in florida in fact that was a georgia invention uh and kansas uh georgia um has its own elections police force and brian kemp used the georgia bureau of investigation as his private police force terror you'll see in the film terrorizing people uh um if you saw in the in the trailer some students were registering senior citizens and he called in the GBI. They kick in the door. They they handcuff people. Ten thousand Koreans vote the the Korean American voter registration group. Um, they were registering ten thousand Koreans and they didn't see the names appear on the voter rolls. They called up Kemp's office, says, where's where's our voters? And his response was to send in the Georgia Bureau of Investigation, kick in the door, seize their computers, arrest a bunch of elderly vote registrars. And uh, then drops the charges, of course. I mean, you have to understand this. So but it wasn't the, the point is, is that Georgia has had this kind of what you call a Gestapo or some type of voter terrorism organization where you take where you criminalize voter registration. You criminalize uh, minor errors like right now. Ensei Ufo, the head of the new Georgia project, is facing 10 years in prison. I kid you not. The head of the new Georgia project is facing 10 years in prison. Because they said that she submitted some registration forms after a 10 day deadline for submitting forms. And as you get someone's signature, you got 10 days to put it in. They claim that she took like 12 days and now they're charging with a felony crime, 10 years in prison. <laughs> this is what they're doing. So, yes, is it it happened to Georgia. Now it's moving to Florida. Uh, um, Secretary of State, uh, former Secretary of State Chris Kobach in Kansas had his private police force, and, and he was the first uh, secretary of state to get the right to actually arrest and indict people as secretary of state. We're going to see this spread around. By the way, Kobach just won his primary for attorney general in Kansas. So look for more problems. I see this uh, criminalization of voter registration. I see this using uh, police terror tactics uh, to intimidate voter registrars and, and citizen voters and, and poll workers as a very, very, very dangerous new business. Indeed it is. Uh, we have 103 people on the call. Uh, Stephen Kaiser, were you next? And then Mary. Stephen Kaiser and Mary, Steven. followed by Steve Spitz. Stephen Kaiser, are you with us? And Mary, I'll unmute you as well. Yeah. Oh, okay. I'm unmuted now. Finally. Please go ahead. Uh, you know, since the Republicans have been the minority party since the Great Depression, you can understand why they might want to come to this type, uh, this strategy uh, of equaling their chance so they have a better chance in winning these elections. But they've been doing this for over 20 years now. And is the, is the election law so weak? Is there, there's nothing that can be done? I would think it had to be done at the federal level. But at this point, it, it absolutely has to take the proportions of conspiracy, certainly among secretaries of state that are trying to, uh, you know, keep people from voting like that. Is any any counter crimes? Has any crime been done that that action can be brought by these people that have been uh, knocked off the polls against the secretaries of state doing this? Well, this is very interesting. Number one, uh, Helen Butler and I sued Brian Kemp as secretary of state and then his successor, Brad Raffensperger. What we wanted was just this information, communications with other secretaries of state, in particular, Chris Kobach, who was the secretary of state of Kansas and and Trump's, you know, vote suppression, vote suppressor in chief. Um, and so we won the right to open their files. And then, believe it or not, uh, Kemp said that all the files had been disposed of. And I have to understand that by itself is a violation of federal law. You can't get rid of any record involving the removal of voters from voter rolls, but he did. Um, now, I don't hold much hope for federal law, except for a bit. As I said, you can't make major change. You can't start attacking the voter rolls within 30 days of a federal election. And even like I said, the Republicans, the Republican 
uh, county clerks and magistrates called on that federal law not to do these mass challenges because they didn't want this in the middle of COVID two weeks before the, an election. But now they don't have that choice. But Georgia law, um, I'm very interested in Fannie Willis's use of of the Georgia racketeering laws uh, in, in this uh, potential indictment of um, of uh, Trump's associates and maybe Trump himself, certainly Giuliani and others. Uh, the Georgia racketeering laws are quite powerful and you've got a good prosecutor. So, you know, we might see a shift there. Fantastic. Uh, Mary, Mary, you're next. And then uh, Steve Spitz, uh, I'll, I'll bring you and you had a very interesting suggestion. Uh, okay. Mary well, Sh Sherman. Hey, uh, hello all. Um, I just wanted to bring to light it, what we're talking about now and Break up a bit. the United States is, for me, it's more like talking about, uh, it's more like talking about one grain of sand upon a large beach because mm -hmm. I'm seeing all these same practices happening throughout the world, throughout Africa. Um, they yes. forced people to go to digital voting in Africa, and then the machines were all hacked. Um, people that went to go vote, including a friend of mine that was running for office, were beaten at the poll stations so they couldn't vote, were sent to the hospital um, because they were being attacked by the Republican parties of their country. The, the thugs that were hired, no different than the Trumpsters we have here. So it's actually a global problem, and we need to really start looking at it. And Greg, I would love if you wanted to work on how this is becoming a global problem and not just a U.S. problem. I would love to work with you because I network with people all over the world that are giving me their insight into the voter suppression and voter tampering and the attacks on the Democratic parties around the world, let alone the people's parties, people that are grassroots people like you and myself that may run for office that are being physically attacked and beaten and put in hospitals on voting day. Okay. So that's, uh, yes. that's what I want to say. And Greg, I'd love to connect with you if you'd like to work on a global look at that. Well, two things. One, I would like to connect with you about the global situation, but I, I actually have been following it. For those who know my background, I was a I was investigative reporter for BBC television out of London and The Guardian. And in that role, I was sent to Mexico and I, uh, I was able to uncover the, the way that they stole the election from AMLO in 2006. And um, and uh, I should say that I have to be very careful because uh, in 2018, AMLO did win. A point I've always tried to make is that they can't steal all the votes all the time. Better be careful. Last time I said that on air, my YouTube was taken down. Um, and uh, that's, by the way, something we, we do need to talk about. The left has, stop, has got to stop this censorship mania because um, I'm getting killed all over the place by the Democratic program of, uh, of uh, massive censorship on Facebook and Twitter right. and other and LinkedIn and other outfits. Um, we either we if if we want if we believe in democracy and freedom and freedom of speech, we got to walk the walk. It's really I important. Agree. And now, in terms of other nations, so I was in Mexico, I was in um, I was in the Congo, in uh, in the DRC, and and uh, many other states. And I would love to continue this discussion. I work on many issues other than voting rights, but I keep coming back to that because if you don't have voting rights, you don't have any rights. Right. So I'm happy Freedom. to work on this internationally. Yeah. And not surprisingly, Greg has been a big part of the uh, movement on nuclear power. A lot of his early stories, uh, especially having to do with the Shoreham reactor in, uh, in India Point in New York, have been critical. And we're seeing in California, which we'll deal with later, uh, the governor of California now simultaneously sabotaging solar power and promoting nuclear power. Well, this that's a great, Gavin. I should. I, this is very important. By the way, can I bring up something in response to that? Please. Harvey, which is that uh, the first time I went to Georgia was an investigation of the of Georgia Power and Southern right. Company for racketeering and murder. By the way, um, and um, so I was looking at, at this electric company, which is basically a criminal enterprise parading as an electric company, 
and that's in Georgia. And one of the biggest issues in Georgia, you have to understand, is the building of the first nuclear plant in three decades in America, the Votal Nuclear Plant, which Brian Kemp is a huge supporter of, 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 of building this nuclear plant, and Stacey Abrams has opposed it. And Stacey Abrams' concern is that it is bankrupting the average bill payer in Georgia. So when you steal, and this is very, very important, as I've said in my books, like Best Democracy Money Can Buy and Billionaires and Ballot Bandits and other books, people don't steal votes to steal elections. They steal votes to steal the money. <laughs> and in Georgia, that means building the, the, the number one issue for the Georgia elite, I'm telling you right now, is finishing the Votal Nuclear Plant. Right. And they, that's, they're stealing this election, or they were, would like to steal this election. Mainly, I'm telling you right now, their big purpose is uh, to make sure that they jam through this the massive, massive surcharges on electric bills to pay right. for this nuclear plant and Kemp to enrich his buddies. $30 billion and counting. Mm -hmm. And it's still not open. Uh, that's the V-O-G-T-L-E. It'll, it'll never open. <laughs> never. I hope to God you're right, man, because if that thing opens, oy. okay, uh, uh, Steve Smith and then Alex. Steven? Yes. Steven, uh, my, uh, my fellow uh, Wolverine. Uh, go you blue. Had a cute go note blue in the chat. <laughs> so, so uh, Greg, um, yeah. I'm wondering whether New Jersey resident Dr. Oz should be challenged in Pennsylvania when he attempts to vote. And there, are, there's a interesting precedent for, for this. Uh, a friend of mine in Virginia, where I live, uh, some years ago challenged Ken Starr who had moved to California from voting in Virginia and Starr, uh, when he was challenged, slinked away knowing that he didn't legitimately have a right to vote in Virginia. Well, I would rather let the voters make that decision. I mean, uh, the, the fact that Oz obviously <laughs> parachuted into uh, Pennsylvania to run for office, let the voters decide that they don't like that. So I'm not okay. so I'm not great on, on stopping people from running for office or from voting. But I do want to make sure that the voters make the decision. Well, the fact is, uh, Steve, you got to be <laughs> Dr. Dr. Oz actually lives in Turkey, but that's a different story. <laughs> OK, uh, Alex Williams. Alex, uh, go ahead. 104 people with us. Go ahead, Alex. Hello. Alex. Yeah. Um, yes. I wanted to say I wanted to ask first, where can I get that information about um, uh, the governor of Georgia and his the historical background on that, because and because I, I I'm no fan of Brian Kemp, but that's 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 you can't even make that up with the whole slavery thing. <laughs> yeah, that, that I can't. That's too too. I guess it's possible, but I, I just I, I just got to find out for myself to show to tell other people. And the okay. other thing is. Um, um, the voter suppression that that I remember you saying, Greg Palace, about um that list. I, I think you mentioned the guy's name from Kansas. Chris Are they Lock. still doing that? No, actually, this is a very good two things. Number one, uh, on uh, Brian Kemp's family, and it's uh and and the history of uh, of holding uh, enslaved Africans. Uh, that goes back. Uh, that was a lot. That was actually the biggest part of our research for the past year is uncovering that and actually going back to the plantation. It's funny if you go to the Roswell King plantation, the 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 uh, manor house, the, the Barrington Manor House and, and uh, Roswell. And you talk to the guys behind the desk and say, well, aren't these people aren't isn't there the uh, the current governor, the 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 child of these People, I say, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's Governor Kemp's place. <laughs> wow. and, and then we went to Butler Island, um, and uh, where um, Roswell King was the uh, uh, overseer, cruel, internationally infamous. By the way, overseer. He wasn't just. They were all nasty, but this guy was. It was a piece of work. And look, Brian Kemp didn't enslave anyone. But he is covering up an important part of history. And I spoke to Congressman Barrow, who's recently retired, Congressman Barrow out of Athens. And um, 
he was saying, look, my family. Yeah, my family, we there we had enslaved people, people, you know, we cap captive people working for us. That's the source of part of our of our wealth today. And I'm not going to run away from it. I'm going to accept it and say we got to correct this situation. We have to talk about it. He said, but Brian Kemp is doing everything he can not only to hide from it, but he's passed a law against basically against teaching history. Now, why would a guy whose family brought for, brought the first enslaved Africans to Georgia? Why in the world would this guy say you can't teach history? Uh <laughs> Hmm. So, you know, it's like you got to put these things together and and it's very important. So historical amnesia is is part of his campaign. And and it took us a lot of work because he worked very hard at this. By the way, he does have a cousin who lives in Virginia who says, you know, my cousin Brian, he just won't admit how we made our money. And she is working very hard with the with the people that they formally held captive or the, the descendants of the people that they formerly held captive to rectify the situation. And she's saying, look, I'm not guilty. I didn't bring anyone from Africa, but we have to face this. And, and my cousin won't face it. Of course he won't. Wow. It's, I, actually, Greg, I got to correct you. It's, it's not amnesia. It's a lobotomization. <laughs> well, I should also say, if you want the information on the history, watch this great film that's coming out in a month called Vigilante. George's vote suppression hitman with Greg Palace. Martin Sheen is our executive producer. And you can and go to gregpalace.com to get the uh, you'll be able to get the DVD, um, eventually download the film. We're going to find out where it's going to be uh, broadcast, uh, but um, it will be we will be showing it around the country. And for those who want to sponsor a showing like when I had Best Democracy, we had like 100 showings around the country. The right wing is showing 2000 mules. Millions of people have seen it. We need to get people to see the other side of this story. And that's why we need to get, and that's why I am promoting the film. I don't make any money off it. I have a not-for-profit foundation. <laughs> I've put in my own money and uh, we've had some, some great people helping us out, but we got to get it out. We got to get this information out. Yeah, so everybody, please do help with distribution. Uh, the, the contacts are in the chat. Greg, it's great to have you. Um, for those of you who are curious, I'm wearing a Fordham shirt because there's a, uh, a guest we're trying to entice, I will not name, uh, who teaches at Fordham. So trying to make her feel more comfortable. Uh, and also my daughter just got a MSW from there. Paul Sherman, I think you may be the last. We still have 105 people with us. Go ahead, Paul. Yeah, I appreciate it, uh, RV. And uh, thanks. Looking forward to seeing the film, Greg. Um, I, I just have one observation, a question. If you've ever encountered this method of uh, voter suppression, uh, quite a few friends, uh, I'm up in Northern California, um, mm -hmm. San Jose, have encountered, well, again, another reason to, important to update your voter registration card. I like that for the point of the signature. Some people have signatures that are humanly readable and cursive that more or less you can see the alphabetic letters. And other people have, have signatures that just look like a wiggly scribble. Now, unfortunately, over time, these are, I, I know, three people that have basically the same voter registration card and their wiggly scribble has changed, has evolved as they've gotten older. And they have twice, in two elections, their vote has been in um, suspended status. Basically, again, another reason after you vote, go to the web website of the secretary, the registrar of the county, and confirm that the, that the vote is accepted. Easy to do if it's vote by mail. And I know three people that the confirmation has shown the website pending, pending signature and mismatch. And so what do you recommend? Do you recommend people not use their natural wiggly scribbles because somebody doesn't know if it's there or just a, a vote curing person um, is a little bit overworked or stressed that day and says, mismatch and then wait i just Go lost ahead. you Go ahead. wait i think i just lost no no we, we have a, we have a 90 second uh, uh okay okay in. so so uh very quickly thank you. thank you um thank you that's very important as we tell everyone and as rosario dawson said in the billboards that we put up in atlanta um check your registration you think you're registered well you may not be you've either been purged or they don't like your registration something's happened always always check your registration 
a, a good 60 days before the election. I know I checked my registration in California a couple of years ago and I uh, and I was it said no such voter. So I re-registered on the spot. I always recommend registering. Never, never, never register on a piece of paper. One of those little yellow cards. Never always do it online. Always. So you can get make sure that it's in the system and take a screenshot and get a receipt for it. Don't fill out a piece of paper because when it's keyed in about one in 10 are keyed in wrong, you lose your vote. And Georgia, it's really nasty. They have something called exact match, though that's been loosened a bit by the courts and by Kemp under criticism. So that if you sign your name, you know, Johnny L. Smith, but your driver's license does not have Johnny L. Smith or has Johnny L. Smith Jr., now you've got a mismatch. You've got a problem. So make sure that that you register, check your registration, re-register if you have to. Every contact you make with your county elections board is good because that shows that you are still an, a, quote, active voter. Just even contacting the board goes on your record, which is important. And so it's this endless fight to not only get people registered and voting, but to keep them registered and get their vote counted always. And as you say, that was an excellent point in California and elsewhere. You can check if your absentee ballot has been accepted. And if it says pending, you better go into your county elections board and get your vote. Um, as they say, cured, that is uh, qualified for county. So very good, very good point. And California is one of the worst states in America for voting, by the way. Really amazing. That's that's, that's a different story that I did for The Guardian. But, you know, like so it's not just Kemp and the Republicans. Unfortunately. Um, you know, uh, you do have a pro big problem in California with the Democratic Party. We'll go to George Ripley, our last question. And then, Greg, we'll let you wrap up. It's been okay, a spectacular hour. Fantastic stuff, as always, with Greg Ballast. Uh, Gre George Ripley, go ahead. George. I'm very excited to see your film. Uh, you briefly mentioned that you had uh, discussed previously the 2000 mules and that you briefly touch on it. Could you go into a little more depth on that? Because I've been uh, since it came out with such excitement and so forth, it seems to have dropped off the radar completely. And I haven't seen much debunking going on or any kind of discussion. It's, it's a, it? Yeah, it's a deeply serious issue. This film, 2000 Mules, is the new birth of a nation. For those who don't know, and this is important to understand the background, we have this in my film. Uh, in, uh, uh, it was in 1915, so 100 years ago, that uh, D.W. Griffith made Birth of a Nation, which was the number one film of the time, the first full length uh, serious talkie shown at the White House. Right. And it was showing white white actors in blackface casting an extra ballot stuffing the ballot boxes 2000 mules repeats that charge it's birth of a nation is the elders of zion of black voting and 2000 mule is elders of zion of black voting part two it's about it's supposedly in in uh georgia and michigan wisconsin and philadelphia and arizona supposedly uh, black voters are paid and they, they make it clear that's black voters, except some Hispanics, black voters getting uh, ten dollars each to stuff a ballot in a ballot box and they give them stacks of ballots. They're legitimate ballots, they claim, but they fill them out. So they have to fake. They And by the way, they claim that we added up their numbers over eight hundred thousand illegal ballots were cast in the last presidential election. That's why Trump supposedly won, especially in Georgia. Well, here's the thing is that I, I won't go through the whole thing because I could take an hour debunking the film 2000 Mules. We take a couple of minutes in in vigilantes. But for example, they claim that they have that they have videotape. Every single drop box in America has a security camera and they keep claiming that these voters vote again and again and again. These mules keep going back to the same boxes and they show one guy like four times. Well, has he been going to four different drop boxes? No, it's the same exact shot shown four times. They never they say he goes to 27 mailboxes. They claim they have the video, but they never show it. The other thing is they show, you know, and of course, as pointed out by Latasha Brown, when she's watching the film on on our screen, she goes, they show a black man putting a ballot into a drop box. He drops it and he puts it back in. And, and a second ballot, because you, when you go to a drop box, you generally take your family ballots. And they said, and this guy actually said, there's O.J. Simpson running away from the scene of the crime. 
And all it was is a black man casting a ballot. So they've decided that if you see a black man casting a ballot, you know already that's a criminal action. All he was doing was casting a ballot. There's zero evidence that he's doing anything else. Plus, by the way, they had his license plate and his face, and they blur out his face and license plate. Well, I'm, I've been a reporter for BBC for you know two decades. I've never blurred out a perpetrator's name. If I have a criminal on camera, I go in close. And if I have their their um, their license plate, I go and go find them in their car and confront them. So it's but the other final thing that that you have to know about, they say that the ultimate technical thing that says that thousands of people have keep voting again and again and again is something called geo tracking, where they take people's cell phones. They say, oh, look. That guy went to that Dropbox. That guy went to that Dropbox. That guy went, he went to 27 Dropboxes. They said the average mule went to 23 Dropboxes. Well, what are they doing going to all these Dropboxes? Well, geotracking is only accurate to about 93 feet. So anyone who daily, for some reason, walks by a Dropbox is a mule. <laughs> and so, so I would said, let's not call the film 2000 mules let's call it 2000 mailmen who else goes by dropbox every day right so it it's crazy but it's selling the idea of voter fraud that black people commit voter fraud black people stuff ballot boxes they're being paid by soros and zuckerberg because of course it's going to be jewish billionaires doing it and um it's very dangerous it's extremely dangerous and it's extremely effective. So if you want to see the antidote to 2000 mules, go to gregpalast.com. That's G-R-E-G-P-A-L-A-S-T and sign up to get a copy of, uh, of Vigilante's Georgia votes, Vigilante Georgia's vote suppression hitman. And uh, if you want to do showings, small, large community groups, labor unions, uh, voting <laughs> rights groups, uh, massage circles, <laughs> We're going to help you do that. We'll get we'll get this DVD disc to you, et cetera. We are nonprofit. We're not in this to make any money. All right. Well, thank you so much, Greg. There's a lot of notes to you in the chat. So please okay. make sure you get the chat. Can and, you uh, uh, send me those? I don't know. I'm not that familiar with this. System. Steve, uh, Steve Caruso, our tech in chief. Will, will I hope, Steve, if you can send Greg the chat, he can do that. That will be great. Greg, thank you so much for being with us. We and really appreciate it. You are the greatest. And um, uh, give our best to Lenny, and we will be talking again, okay? Okay. See That's you in, uh, see you in Atlanta, in LA. And um, uh, while you were speaking, Greg, somebody knocked on my door to sell, sell me a solar system. So <laughs> I'm afraid <laughs> you cost solar. him a sale. <laughs> anyway, uh, and Paul Newman, who's with us, does have a solar system. Greg, you're around the corner. Thank you. Susan's here till uh, Tuesday. So if you want oh. to get together, oh, let's do it. <laughs> Can okay? do. Bye. All right, bro. Take care, everybody. Thank you. All right, we're going to move ahead. That was spectacular. Next week, by the way, we have a, another feature-length presentation from the great Keith Ellison, the uh, Attorney General of the state of Minnesota. It's going to be a grassroots Congress with grassroots organizations going to be presenting, strutting their stuff. They've been compiled by Wendy Lederman. And Wendy, you now have three groups, uh, grassroots groups we'd like you to introduce and each can make uh, a, a three minute presentation. It will be great. We uh, uh, really welcome you. And Wendy has been compiling a master list of grassroots groups from around the country. Uh, so go ahead, Wendy, please, from Fort Lauderdale. Go ahead. Thank you so much. Um, so we have um, Helena Buckman with um, Kansas for Constitutional Freedom. And if you guys remember um, just a few weeks ago, a few months ago, this was a group that was really instrumental in um, kind of making sure that the ballot amendment to take away women's rights um, didn't succeed. So we're really excited to hear from her on kind of how they did that and their organizing to galvanize. We also have um, Marta Hansen from um, Power of the Polls is with us and um, Yvonne Gutierrez for Latino Victory as well. So we'll, I guess we'll go in order. So we'll go ahead with um, Helena and thank you all so much for your patience and I hope you enjoyed Greg as much as we did. So thank Fantastic. you. Fantastic. And each of you gets three to four minutes and we're welcome. Thank you, Wendy, for doing such a great job of gathering such groups. So go ahead, please. Awesome, yeah, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm Helena Buckman. I'm the field director for Kansans for Constitutional Freedom. 
Um, like Wendy said, we're the coalition that led the charge against the constitutional amendment on our August 2nd ballots, the first vote in the country um, on abortion rights um, after Roe fell in June. So uh, I know I'm here to talk about um, our get out the vote tactics and what worked for us. Um, just a real quick uh, overview of what our organization is. We were a coalition of five civil and reproductive rights groups. So the ACLU of Kansas, Planned Parenthood, um, Great Plains, Trust Women, which is an abortion provider in our state, um, Urge, Unite for Reproductive and Gender Equity, and then the Kansas Values Institute. And so we had organizers from those organizations on the ground um, doing the work for us, which was incredible. They, they are awesome. Um, they are just, you know, my heroes. Um, and they executed a really great uh, field program that uh, allowed us to support the messaging that we invested in um, to, to defeat this amendment and make sure that Kansans protected these rights. So we did a lot of phone calling. Um, we had a lean field operation. And so uh, a lot of our our efforts to make sure that we were talking to Kansans across the state in all 105 counties was using an auto dialer. Um, so we used through talk, had a great experience with them. Um, and in the final days before the election, um, we did advanced ballot chasing. Um, advanced ballots made up about a third. Sorry, my dog is licking his bowl really loudly right now, of course. Um, so advanced ballots made up about a third of total votes this election, um, and which is um, really exciting for Kansas. Um, especially given, uh, you know, what Greg said earlier about uh, our history with elections. Uh, Chris Kobach, uh, we've, we've beat him twice in a row. I hope that this year we will beat him a third time. Um, three for. So we did advanced ballot chasing, we did vote planning, and we did election day planning. Um, we had a plan for an electorate that was, um, you know, smaller than a general election electorate because we have closed primaries. Um, so generally only Democrats and Republicans vote in our primaries. Um, which was intentional by the legislature when they put this on our ballot. Uh, so getting unaffiliated voters out, talking to Republicans who make up the vast majority of the primary electorate and meeting them where they were on this, you know, highly personal issue was really important to us. So we did a lot of calling, we did a lot of texting, um, providing voters with information about their polling places. Um, we also obviously did door knocking um, in Kansas. We have five counties that make up the vast majority of the population in our state. And so a lot of our door knocking efforts were concentrated in those five counties. But something that I think that we did was really good um, was that we we decentralized a little bit um, and we worked with other groups that were already established in our state um, to, you know, not gatekeep um, organizing and to not gatekeep our list and our message. And we let them um, use their relationships that they had already created over the years um, to meet voters where they were. So I think we we did a really good job of that. We empowered volunteers who were in communities that weren't necessarily going to be able to be reached by our campaign at the door. And we let them organize groups of volunteers themselves, gave them the list, empowered them with the tools and the messaging. Um, and we, that this was volunteers from all political spectrums, right? Like we had, Democrats, obviously Democrats were very energized about this, but we also had a lot of moderate Republicans who volunteered with us and conservative voters who um, didn't want government overreach and government intrusion. So we built a really diverse coalition that supported our unifying message. Um, we obviously got a groundswell of support from across the country, um, which we were able to kind of funnel into those calls. Um, we also were able to, you know, money, late money, happens um, and we were getting a lot of attention at the end of the election since we were the first vote on this in the country um, and we were able to invest that in um, expanding our paid canvas and expanding our paid phones program. So I think, you know, I'm happy to answer any questions, but that's just a brief overview of what we did. Um, and, you know, I want to highlight the young progressives in our state who, um, you know, made sure that we were organizing in their communities, that we were organizing Digitally as well, there was this incredible group called Vote Nay, like what a horse says. Um, and they were trying to reclaim cowboy, cowgirl culture, um, horse girls for abortion rights. And um, they just did some really, really cool stuff online. And um, in our final weekend, they organized ponies to the polls events um, where you could take a selfie with a horse and go vote and then go knock on doors. So i um, happy to talk more about Great. anything that we did, but I appreciate having me. Thank you so much. Um, 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 put your 
uh, contacts in the chat, please. Uh, uh, Wendy, did you want to, yeah. thank you so much, Helena. Did you want to introduce your next presenter? Sure, thank you. And make sure, Helena, you let us know how we can support you as well, all right? Thanks so much for being here. I'm sure we have uh, Marta Hansen next from Power the Polls, and we're excited to hear what the work that they're doing. So Marta, welcome, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Hi, everyone. My name is Marta Hansen, she, her pronouns, and I am the National Partnerships Director for Power the Polls. Um, and I'm going to speak to you briefly about poll workers. Um, so if any of you have been a poll worker, raise your hand, drop it in the chat. Would love to. Uh, excellent. I see Paul raising his hand. Great to, great to hear it. Um, so I'm going to briefly touch on why you should care about poll workers if you care about elections, why you should consider being a poll worker if you have not before, and how you can help us activate to address poll worker gaps leading up to the November election. And Mike, I see your comment in the chat. I also love poll workers. Um, so Power the Polls is a national and nonpartisan organization uh, or initiative really to recruit the next generation of poll workers in order to ensure a free, fair, safe, and accessible election for every voter. It is our vision that voting is a positive and empowering experience for every person and that anyone who shows up at a polling place has people who look like them and speak their language who can support them in voting. Uh, we were founded back in 2020 when, as you may recall, amidst the first wave of the pandemic, there was a huge nationwide polling shortage or poll worker shortage, and we recruited over 700,000 potential new poll workers in less than 100 days in 2020. So we're back at it in 2022. Uh, and the way that we work is we work closely with all 5,000 election offices all across the country to help identify very specifically where gaps are. And then we work with our partner organizations and our, our list of folks who have signed up to help address those gaps. So why should you care about poll workers? Uh, in short, elections come down to poll workers. There is a direct link between poll working and a functioning electoral system. So if you care about election protection, which I know you do, every single person on this call, uh, you should really care. Uh, without poll workers, People can't vote. Polling places are closed. That leads to longer lines, uh, lack of access to a polling place, and thus disproportionately impacts certain communities, low-income communities, communities of color, and rural communities. On average, your fun fact of the evening is that it takes about 1 million poll workers to run an election in a general or in a presidential election year. So it takes a lot of people. Uh, it takes a lot of people. Um, and you should also think about being a poll worker because I would argue it is the single most effective nonpartisan thing that you can do to support our democracy. It's really about focusing on the process of functioning elections rather than any one particular outcome. And poll workers really help their neighbors vote by ensuring that positive, empowering experience at the polling place that I mentioned uh, earlier. So for those of you who haven't had a chance to be a poll worker yet, uh, poll workers show up early, they set up the space, uh, they make sure technology functions, including things like accessible voting machines, prevent long lines, provide translation assistance when needed, and really just make the experience of democracy a positive one. Uh, think about, it's really about you and your neighbors at your local community center, a place of worship, fire station, schoolhouse, wherever it is, Paul, I see your heart, I love it. Uh, absolutely. <clears throat> uh, we are seeing a need for poll workers this year. The biggest trends that we are seeing are needs for folks who have uh, multilingual capabilities, who are tech savvy and can work with tablets and or help troubleshoot voting machines and who have availability for early voting. So what can you do? My ask for all of you this evening um, is to help us activate uh, as many potential poll workers as possible and really help spread the word about this being a really valuable thing that everyday people can do to also get paid um, and show up and support their communities on election day. So I'll drop the Power of the Polls website in the chat in just a second. I see Stephen also already did. Um, when you sign up through our website, you are redirected to your local election 
elections office and where you can complete an application through that local election office to enter the pool of folks who have signed up in your community to, to, to be ready to serve. And then as part of Power the Polls, we'll share resources to help you prepare for your trainings, which you go in um, and meet with your election official and they will train you on what to expect and what the rules are for your specific place. So my call to action is threefold. Number one, talk about poll workers when you talk about election protection. Number two, sign up as a poll worker in your own community. And number three, encourage your family and friends to do the same. Thank you, Wendy and everyone for having me here. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You're fantastic. Um, uh, put all your chat, your connections in the chat, please, and we'll certainly add you to the master list. Uh, uh, Wendy, who's our third presenter? Thank you, um, and thanks so much, Marta. That was awesome. I'm sure we'll get lots of support for you. Um, so we had um, Latino victory, and there was some confusion where I think someone had to jump off, and um, and another person was supposed to jump on and I'm not seeing um, if um, if Joani is here, Joani um, Adamas, I think her name is. I'm not seeing her though. We were gonna have Yvonne um, Gutierrez and she was here, but she had to jump off and now I'm not seeing Yohani. So okay. we might have to get to Latino victory next week unless someone jumps on, maybe we'll find a minute for them. All right, so Wendy, will you tell us briefly where you're at with the list that you're compiling of grassroots groups and how people, we still have 90 people with us, uh, can contribute and be part of the compilation of this list. Thank you. Yeah, we're getting close to about 600 groups <laughs> on this list. Um, if you'd like, I can do a, a screen share of it if you want to see it. Um, yeah, go ahead. Let's do that. Okay. All right. And um, I'll talk. Thanks. Um, and I'll uh, drop my... Um, my email in the chat again and on um, that way people can um let me know if you're you're can you see this all right yeah fantastic okay cool so yeah we're at um 564 right now so if, um i'll put my my email in the chat in just a second and yeah these are um a bunch of get out the vote groups um mike hirsch sent me some really awesome groups yesterday and i added a bunch of those um kind of zeroing in on um, different states and really localizing because, you know, that's, that's where a lot of the magic happens is in the, the small little pockets. Um, also focusing on different cultural communities um, to really reach out to people that are underserved in those areas um, and, and just a lot of the Asian communities, a lot of um, is uh, Muslim, Latino, uh, just underserved. And of course the, the black vote. Um, youth groups as well, because even if some of them aren't able to vote now, they can get their parents to vote and they can get, they, they tend to be really um, vocal because, you know, it's their future on the line. Um, and yeah, and I think we're gonna keep, um, as we move forward even past this Congress, I think we'll probably feature more groups um, later on and just keep, keep the love going because this is, this is what it takes. You know, these are the people on the ground and um, you can see, I mean, I'm just still in, in the V's and the W's here. So, um, so yeah, just, just working on, on targeting as many groups as I can from all different walks of life and getting everyone together, primarily um, nonpartisan groups. But um, I mean, I say anyone who's anti-fascist, anti-nuclear, then, um, you know, we're, we're good to, to work with everyone. And even groups that might not necessarily be only focused on get out the vote or um, or watching the polls, if you will. Um, but people that that include GOTV work in what they do is, is welcome as well. So if anybody knows any good groups that they want to feature and get them um, in the loop, you know, because the whole idea is to, um, to to network and to get everybody on the same page. So they're not just off in their on their own little cloud doing their own little thing. And um, we can move together as one vital force to, to really start to make a difference and be on the same page and communicate with each other. Okay, one fantastic, very impressive. So Thank anybody you have a, a contacts with grassroots groups that might go on this list, uh, we need uh, you know names, phone numbers, email addresses, URLs, uh, send them all to Wendy, Wendy's email is in the chat. <clears throat> and uh, let's move ahead with this. So we're basically out of time on our 
uh, recorded portion of the call. We've been engineered by Mike Hirsch. This has been 107 um, a Green Grassroots Emergency Election Protection Coalition Zoom calls. Next week, we will feature uh, keynote uh, Keith Ellison, and we will have many, many more presentations from Wendy uh, from grassroots groups around the country. Technically, it's going to be a grassroots organizing Congress. I'm sure there'll be other issues we're going to want to discuss. Uh, thank you, Steve Caruso, for your great job of engineering. Thank you, Greg Powis, for being with us. And so many more in the next um, uh, half hour or so, we're going to focus on what's happening in Ohio, which is incredibly insane. Uh, the possibilities of Trump being indicted, uh, which will be a lively conversation. And we'll start with what's happening at Diablo Canyon in California, which is really at a crucial stage. So thank you, everybody, for being with us. As I say, this has been the 107th uh, Green Grassroots Emergency Election Protection Coalition call. Uh, it will be posted um, at um, uh, our website, grassrootsep.org. Uh, I'll write a blurb and then Thursday, 5 p.m. Eastern time, it will be podcast at the Progressive Radio Network. So thank you everybody. And we will see you next week. We will not be meeting by the way, uh, on Labor Day, which is in two weeks, um, but uh, we'll be glad to be with, I believe it's two weeks, yeah. Um, um, but ne next week, of course, with Keith Ellison, uh, we're really looking forward to